Xerxes I, the fourth king of the Achaemenid dynasty of Persia. He reigned from 486 BC until his assassination in 465 BC. He succeeded his father, Darius the Great, and is most famously known for his invasion of Greece in 480 BC, including the famous battles of Thermopylae, Salamis, and Plataea. Although these military efforts ultimately failed and limited Persian expansion into Europe, Xerxes also focused on grand architectural projects, such as completing the Persepolis Palace Complex, showcasing his capabilities as an administrator of an empire that extended from India to the Balkans. Despite the negative portrayal in Greek historical narratives, modern assessments recognize Xerxes as a significant ruler, whose reign combined ambitious military campaigns with impressive cultural achievements, showing once again the complexities of his leadership when the Persian Empire experienced its heights. Welcome to the channel, everyone. Back to the old times of the Achaemenid Empire today. We recently did a video on Darius the Great. So why not talk about the life of his son, Xerxes. Perhaps you recognize the name from the film 300. Well, newsflash. That depiction was not quite as accurate as many might want to believe. As we've mentioned, sources of the Greek times, well, they certainly paint him in quite a negative light. History is always written by the victors, I suppose. But we're going to try and get to the truth of it today while still talking about those Greek sources. We'll try and be as fair as possible. Now, before we start, how about you leave your thoughts in the comments? What do you think about Xerxes? And what else would you like to see in the future? Perhaps more Achaemenid kings? Or perhaps something from a little bit earlier, back to the Bronze Age? Let me know, and I'll put it on the list. But... Let's get nice and relaxed for now, and begin the life of Xerxes the Great. Now, as we've mentioned, Xerxes' father was Darius, who reigned from 522 to 486 BC as the ruler of the Achaemenid Empire. However, Darius himself was not part of the family of Cyrus the Great, the empire's founder. The situation was a little bit more complicated than that. He somewhat snatched the throne. Well, you gotta take it somehow, don't you? Atosa, the daughter of Cyrus, was the mother of Xerxes. Darius and Atosa wedded in 522 BC, and apparently, Xerxes was born in 518. Yes, all a little complex. If you want to know a little bit more about Darius, well, go and watch the video about him. It should be in the Middle East playlist. Now, continuing on. The Greek conversation, First Alcibiades, states that Persian princes were raised by eunuchs, as it depicts their usual upbringing and education. Commencing at the age of seven, they acquired the skills of horseback riding and hunting, all pretty normal educational routes for a person of noble upbringing in the Achaemenid Empire. Well, upon reaching the age of fourteen, they would usually receive instruction from four tutors, each hailing from aristocratic lineages, who imparted wisdom, justice, prudence, and courage. Persian princes were instructed in the fundamental principles of the Zoroastrian faith, which emphasized the virtues of honesty, bravery, and self-discipline. Do remember that we are talking about times that is around 1,200 years, give or take, before the advent of Islam, when the majority of that area was indeed of the Zoroastrian faith, 
We'll be showing that Ahura Mazda. Well, that's the topic for a different video. I did one a while back, but perhaps I'll do a new one. Now, the discussion of the first Alcibiades further states that fear for a Persian is tantamount to enslavement. So once again, that goes to show these virtues of honesty, bravery, and self-discipline, along with that self-determination. Well, upon reaching the age of 16 or 17, they commence their obligatory 10-year period of national duty, encompassing activities such as archery and javelin training, participation in competitive events for rewards and engaging in hunting pursuits, all fairly normal and not just unique to the Persians. Well, subsequently, they enlisted in the armed forces for around 25 years, following which they were promoted to the esteemed position of elders and counsellors to the monarch. During this era, it was common for families, such as Xerxes, to engage in intermarriage. Now, on to the sources that we have from Xenophon, the Greek historian. His portrayal of the education system among the Persian elite is corroborated by his detailed depiction of Cyrus the Younger, a prince of the Achaemenid dynasty in the 5th century BC, with whom he had quite a close relationship. It suggested that Xerxes likely had a similar background and schooling to Cyrus the Younger, but it remains uncertain if Xerxes acquired literacy skills. Do keep in mind the cuneiform systems of writing were extremely advanced for their times, and at this point, post-Bronze Age collapse, it had certainly moved beyond the point of mere record-keeping, we even have some epic poetry as well, like the Epic of Gilgamesh and Tales of the Flood and Atrahasis. Once again, topics for a separate video, but I digress. Well, of course, the Persians did show a preference for oral tradition rather than written records, but that does not mean that they had a complete lack of written records. So, it is perhaps that Xerxes' upbringing and education may have been similar to those of later Persian rulers, such as Abbas the Great, who ruled the Safavid Empire in the 17th century AD. Well, either way, from 498 BC onwards, it seems that Xerxes had taken up residence at the regal palace of Babylon, was about as regal as you could get in those days. Now, on to the military campaigns against Greece, which would certainly define the life of Xerxes, and of course his father, too. Well, during Darius's early preparations for another military campaign against Greece, a rebellion erupted in Egypt in 486 BC. Do remember, this is post the defeat at the Battle of Marathon. Now, this uprising in Egypt was triggered by the burden of excessive taxes and the forced relocation of skilled artisans to construct the royal palaces back in Susa and Persepolis, which is, of course, east of the boundaries of the Tigris River. Persian law mandated that the king select a successor before embarking on such a perilous expedition, kind of like writing a will of sorts, just in case. Well, in compliance with the law, Darius, when preparing to depart for Egypt, made arrangements for his tomb at Naqsh el Rustam, located about five kilometers away from his royal palace in Persepolis. Well, furthermore, he designated Xerxes, his eldest son from Atosa, as his successor. Nevertheless, Darius was unable to spearhead the military expedition as a result of his deteriorating health, and 
he passed away in October of 486 BC at the age of 64. But, as with succession disputes, they're always a little sticky. Another, named Artobazan, asserted his right to the throne based on his status as the eldest among Darius's offspring. Remember, he was not of the same mother. Now, in contrast, Xerxes maintained that he deserved the crown because he was the son of Atosa, who was the daughter of Cyrus. Xerxes further justified his claim by emphasizing that Cyrus had played a vital role in securing the Persians' freedom, therefore adding a little more weight to the scale. The assertion made by Xerxes was corroborated by Demaratus, a Spartan king in exile who was in Persia during that period. Demaratus further contended that the eldest son did not possess an inherent right to rule, citing Spartan law which stipulated that the first-born son, while the father is reigning, would inherit the kingship. Some contemporary academics see Darius's unconventional choice to pass the throne to Xerxes as a deliberate assessment of the specific status held by Cyrus the Great and his daughter Atosa, and that certainly seems to be the most likely case. But Artobazan was born to Darius too, who was a subordinate at the time. But Xerxes was the first-born son after Darius became ruler. In addition, it's worth noting that Artabazan's mother belonged to the common people, if we want to use such low-brow terms, whereas Xerxes' mother was the offspring of an individual who established the Achaemenid Empire itself. They don't call him Cyrus the Great for nothing. Well, Either way, the scales were tipped in Xerxes' favour, and he ascended to the throne and assumed power after his father in the period of October or perhaps December of 486 BC, at the age of approximately 32. While Xerxes' assumption of royal power remained unchallenged within the Achaemenid dynasty, and among the subjects of the empire, thanks in part to Atosa's influential position and authority. Yes, unfortunately the writing was on the wall for Artabazan. But hey, there's no harm in trying your luck. Well, upon Xerxes' ascension to the throne, unrest was developing within several regions under his rule. Nothing unusual, changes in management. Well, an uprising transpired in Egypt, which was already in a bit of a sticky situation in Darius's time, posing a significant threat that prompted Xerxes to assume personal command of the army in order to reinstate stability. And this also afforded him the chance to commence his reign with a military expedition. In January of 484 BC, Xerxes quelled the rebellion, and replaced the previous satrap, Ferendates, with his full brother, Achaemenes, as the ruler of Egypt, following reports of Ferendates' death during the uprising. The quelling of the Egyptian uprising depleted the military forces that had been assembled by Darius throughout the preceding three years. Consequently, Xerxes was compelled to assemble a new military force for his campaign in Greece, which was a process that was going to consume another four years. It's not easy getting that many men. Well, Babylon had frequent turmoil, too, and they rose against Xerxes on at least two occasions throughout his reign. The initial uprising occurred in either June or July of 484 BC, and was spearheaded by a dissident named Bel Shimani. The uprising led by Bel Shimani was admittedly quite brief, 
as evidenced by Babylonian records, which only trace a span of two weeks during his reign. You can imagine what they did to him. Well, after a span of two years, Babylon gave rise to another insurgent commander, this time by the name of Shamash Eriba. Commencing in the summer of 482 BC, Shamash Eriba successfully captured Babylon, and even a few other adjacent cities, including Borsippa and Dilbat. However, in March of 481 BC, after a prolonged siege of Babylon, Shamash Eriba was ultimately defeated. The exact reason for all the turmoil in Babylon is, well, it's a little unclear, which is not quite sure. Hopefully we can pull some cuneiform tablet out of the ground within the next few years that explains the whole thing. Better start digging. Well, it is possible, however, that the cause was tax hikes. And can you believe that? That people would rise up against their rulers for raising taxes? What a novel idea that is. Well, before these uprisings, Babylon held a unique status within the Achaemenid Empire. You see, the Achaemenid kings were titled King of Babylon and King of the Lands, and that suggests that they considered Babylonia to be somewhat distinct within their empire, yet still connected to their own kingdom through a personal union. Of course, there's all sorts of names for Persian kings, including King of Kings, King of All the Lands, King of Everything, King of the Ice Cream Shop, whatever it is. There is a great many titles. Now, following the uprisings, Xerxes actually removed the title King of Babylon from his official position, and he reorganized this expansive Babylonian satrapy into smaller subdivisions, cutting them off at the knees a little bit, it seems. Now, according to documents written by classical writers, it is commonly believed that Xerxes carried out a rather ruthless retribution against Babylon in response to the two uprisings. According to these accounts, Xerxes dismantled the defensive structures of Babylon and inflicted harm upon the city's temples. According to the accounts, the Esagila suffered significant damage and Xerxes supposedly took the statue of Marduk out of the city, potentially transporting it to Iran and melting it down. According to ancient authors, by the way, who claim that the statue was built completely of gold, apparently it was quite possible to do this. And of course, she had quite a lot of gold at the end. Well, according to contemporary historians such as Amélie Kurt, it is probable that Xerxes actually just demolished the temples completely. However, it's suggested that the narrative of him doing so might have simply originated from a negative attitude towards the Persians among the Babylonians. But there is uncertainty on whether the statue was actually taken from Babylon. Some individuals have even proposed that Xerxes did remove a statue from the cities, but rather than the statue of a deity Marduk, it was the golden figure of a man. Which man? We don't know. Could have been Cyrus the Great, perhaps. But still, we can't find that statue of Marduk. So I tend to believe that it was the statue of Marduk. You see, although references to it are somewhat fewer compared to previous eras, existing historical records indicate that Babylonian New Year's festival persisted in some manner during the Achaemenid Empire, and due to the transition of power from the Babylonians to the Persians, and the subsequent replacement of the city's influential families by Xerxes after the revolt, 
it is likely that the festival's customary rites and events underwent, let us say, significant alterations. Well, in terms of the statue, if you are, in my opinion, going to demoralize an enemy, well, you must remember how Persian and Near East societies generally were with their deities. A lot of the time they were tied to this city, the patron deity of that city, quite like in ancient Egypt too. And of course the pantheon of this area was quite extensive. Taking away this deity, well that's certainly quite a slap in the face, and certainly a terrible omen. Well, now that's just my opinion. But if I was Xerxes, that's what I would have done. Shame if they actually did melt it down, though. I hope they didn't. I hope it's one of those discoveries that we've not yet uncovered. Perhaps it's just under some ruin somewhere, a giant golden statue of Marduk. Very cool. Well, Darius perished while in the midst of assembling a second military force to launch an invasion of the Greek mainland, and, as we've mentioned, his son was entrusted with the responsibility of exacting retribution upon the Athenians, Naxians, and Eretrians for their involvement in the Ionian Revolt, the destruction of Sardis, and of course that rather embarrassing triumph over the Persians at Marathon. Hard to forget that. But starting in 483 BC, Xerxes made preparations for his voyage. He had the Xerxes Canal dug through the isthmus of the Mount Athos Peninsula. Provisions were kept in stations along the road through Thrace. Additionally, two pontoon bridges, which became quite famous and known as Xerxes Pontoon, were constructed across the Hellespont. Xerxes' armies consisted of soldiers from various nationalities, hailing from his vast multi-ethnic empire spanning Eurasia and beyond. These included the Assyrians, Phoenicians, Babylonians, Egyptians, Jews, Macedonians, Ionians, Achaean Greeks, Greeks from Pontus, Colchians, Sindhis, and many others of smaller subgroups. As per the account of the Greek historian Herodotus, Xerxes' initial endeavour to construct the bridge across the Hellespont was unsuccessful due to a storm that caused the destruction of the bridge's flax and papyrus cables. Xerxes, in response, commanded that the Hellespont, the strait itself, be lashed three hundred times, and had shackles thrown into the river. That ought to show it. Serves the Hellespont right for not doing as it's told. While the second endeavour of Xerxes to construct a bridge across the Hellespont proved to be triumphant. Perhaps because of the lashes. Who knows? Well, the Carthaginian invasion of Sicily resulted in Greece losing the backing of the influential rulers of Syracuse and Agrigentum. Now, while ancient sources attribute this to Xerxes, contemporary study casts more than a little doubt on this claim. Additionally, several lesser Greek cities, including Thessaly, Thebes, and Argos, aligned themselves with the Persians. Because do remember that Greece was not a unified entity then. Of course, the seeds were being sown for the Hellenic League, especially in the threat of the Persians, but usually when the Greeks were not fighting the Persians, they were busy enough fighting each other. Well, speaking of fighting, Xerxes emerged quite triumphant in the early skirmishes, and things were looking good. 
Now in the spring of 480 BC, Xerxes departed from Sardis with a formidable force consisting of perhaps one million soldiers and a navy. Among his troops were ten thousand highly skilled fighters, known as the Immortals, as estimated at least by Herodotus. The most up-to-date calculations indicate that the Persian force, in its main number, consisted of approximately sixty thousand individuals engaged in battle. Of course, if you read Herodotus, he will tell you that it was two million or some ridiculous number like this. So do remember that if you are going to read the primary source on it, which I encourage you to do so, and we're about to read a passage from it, to take some of those numbers with a little bit of, uh, bit of a grain of salt. Now, during the Battle of Thermopylae, a very small contingent of Greek soldiers under the command of King Leonidas of Sparta valiantly opposed the significantly larger Persian forces, but were finally overcome. According to Herodotus, the Persians successfully defeated the Spartan phalanx due to the treachery of a Greek citizen named Ephialtes, who informed the Persians of an alternative mountain crossing. Artemisium was disrupted by severe storms that caused a significant damage to Greek ships, leading to the premature halt of the combat, and the Greeks, upon leaving, learning rather of their defeat at Thermopylae, decided to finally retreat. Now, as I said, we're going to read an account from Herodotus, and we do indeed have a lovely little account from him about the moments after the betrayal of Ephialtes, but I'm sure that you're generally familiar with the events of the Battle of Thermopylae, so let's read from that now. Now, as the king was in a great strait, and knew not how he should deal with the emergency, Ephialtes, the son of Eurydimus, a man of malice, came to him and was admitted to a conference. Stirred by the hope of receiving a rich reward at the king's hands, he had come to tell him of the pathway which led across the mountain to Thermopylae, which, by disclosure, he brought destruction of the band of Greeks who had there been withstood the barbarians. This Ephialtes afterwards, from fear of the Lacedaemonians, fled into Thessaly, and during his exile, in an assembly of the Amphictyons held at Pilae, a price was set upon his head by the Philagore. When some time had gone by, he returned from exile, and went to Antisira, where he was slain by Athenades, a native of Trachus. Athenides did not slay him for his treachery, but for another reason, which I shall mention in a later part of my history, yet still the Lacedaemonians honoured him none the less. Thus then did Ephialtes perish a long time afterwards. Besides this, there is another story told, which I do not at all believe, to wit that Onetas, the son of Phanagoras, a native of Caristus, and Corydalus, a man of Antisira, were the person who spoke on this matter to the king, and took the Persians across the mountain. One may guess this story is true, from the fact that the deputies of the Greeks, the Philagore, who must have heard had best means for asserting the truth, did not offer the reward for the heads of Onetas and Corydalos, but for that of Ephialtes of Drachis. And then, from the flight of Ephialtes, which we know to have been on this account. Onetas, I allow, although he was not a Malian, might have been acquainted with the path if he had lived much in part of that country. But as Ephialtes was the person who actually led the Persians round the mountain by the pathway, I leave his name on the record as that of the man who did the deed. Great was the joy of Xerxes on this occasion, 
and as he approved highly of the enterprise which Ephiates undertook to accomplish, he forthwith sent upon the errand of Hidarnes and the Persians under him. The troops left the camp about the time of the lighting of the lamps. The pathway along which way they went was first discovered by the Malians of these parts, who soon afterwards led the Thessalians by it to attack the Phocians. At the time when the Phocians fortified the pass with a wall, and so put themselves under covert from danger. And ever since, the path has always been put to an ill use by the Malians. The Persians took this path, and, crossing the Asopus, continued their march through the whole night, having the mountains of Oeta on their right hand, and on their left those of Trachis. At dawn they found themselves close to the summit. Now the hill was guarded, and as I have already said, by a thousand Phocian men at arms, who were placed there to defend the pathway, and at the same time secure their own country. They had been given the guard of the mountain path, while the other Greeks defended the pass below, because they had volunteered for the service and had pledged themselves to Leonidas to maintain the post. The Greeks at Thermopylae received the first warning of their destruction, which the dawn would bring on them, from the seer Megistias, who read their fate in the victims as he was sacrificing. After this deserters came in, and brought the news that the Persians were marching round the hills. It was still in the night when these men arrived. Last of all, the scouts came running down from the heights, and bought in the same accounts. When the day was just beginning to break, and then the Greeks held a council to consider what they should do, and here opinions were divided. Some were strong against quitting their post, while others contended to the contrary. So when the council had broken up, part of the troops departed, and went their ways homeward to their several states. Part, however, resolved to remain, and stand by Leonidas to the last. End of the account from Herodotus so good. <laughs> Look, even even though sometimes he blows things out of proportion, I just I just like reading Herodotus, okay? It's just good. Now, of course we all know how the Battle of Thermopylae ended up. Of course it was a valiant effort by the Greeks, but ultimately they were overcome. And Following the Battle of Thermopylae, Athens was captured. But the Persians didn't quite get what they were expecting. You see, prior to Xerxes' arrival, the majority of the Athenians had evacuated the city and sought refuge on the island of Salamis, a little contingent endeavor to protect the Athenian Acropolis, however. And once again, a very valiant stand, after which they were vanquished. Xerxes commanded the annihilation of Athens, and set fire to the city, resulting in the creation of a well-documented layer of ruin. The Persians successfully acquired dominion over the entire continent of Greece, located north of the Isthmus of Corinth. But let's see how long they can hold it. Xerxes, against the counsel of Artemisia of Halicarnassus, was persuaded by Themistocles' message to launch an attack on the Greek fleet in unfavorable circumstances, instead of dividing his ships and waiting for the Greek armies to disband. You see, Themistocles was quite clever. I've done a full video on him, but he effectively buddied up with Xerxes, and gave him very poor advice, 
which was presented in a way that was, well, it was deemed as a very wise decision to attack, when really Themistocles was trying to bait him into it. Well, it certainly worked. The Greek navy emerged victorious in the Battle of Salamis in September of 480 BC. Subsequently, Xerxes established a winter encampment in Thessaly. Herodotus reports once again that Xerxes, out of concern that the Greeks may assault the bridges spanning the Hellespont and ensnare his army in Europe, made the decision to withdraw to Asia, bringing the majority of his forces along. Another factor contributing to the retreat could have been the ongoing turmoil in Babylon, once again always causing trouble. Well, the crucial region of the empire demanded the direct involvement of the king, and he couldn't be in two places at a time. So, he left a group of soldiers in Greece to complete the military operation under the command of Mardonius, who, as stated by Herodotus, had initially proposed the idea of retreating. The Persian offensive on Greece was decisively halted the next year at Plataea, when the combined troops of the Greek city-states beat the Persian army. Now, just before we continue on, there is a very good account from the work entitled The Persians by Aeschylus that gives a much more poetic twist to it than I ever could. So, before we move on completely from the Battle of Salamis, I'm going to read from his work, The Persians. The night was passing, and the Grisian host by no means sought to issue forth unseen. But when indeed the day with their white steeds held all the earth resplendent to behold, First from the Greeks the loud resounding din of song triumphant came, and shrill at once echo responded from the island rock. Then upon all barbarians terror fell, thus disappointed, for not as for flight the Hellenes sang the holy paean then, but setting forth to battle valiantly. The bugle with its note inflamed them all, and straight away with the dip of the plashing oars they smote the deep sea water at command, and quickly all were plainly to be seen. Their right wing, first in orderly array, led on, and the second all the armament followed them forth, and meanwhile there was heard a mighty shout. Come! O ye sons of Greeks, make free your country, make your children free, your wives and fanes of your ancestral gods, and your sires tombs, for all we now contend. And from our side the rush of Persian speech replied, No longer might the crisis wait, at once ship smote on ship with brazen beak, a vessel of the Greeks began the attack, crushing the stem of a Phoenician ship. Each on a different vessel turned its prow. At first the current of the Persian host withstood, but when within the strait the throng of ships was gathered, and they could not aid each other but by their own brazen bows were struck, they shattered all our naval host. The Grecian vessels, not unskillfully, were smiting round about. The hulls of ships were overset, the sea was hid from sight, covered with wreckage and death of all men. The reefs and headlands were with corpses filled, and in disordered flight each ship was rowed, as many as were of the Persian host. But they, like tunnies or some shoal of fish with broken oars and fragments of the wrecks, struck us and clove us. And at once a cry of lamentation filled the briny sea, till the black 
darkness I did rescue us. The number of our griefs, not though ten days I talked together could fully tell. But this I know well, that never in one day perished so great a multitude of men. End of the account from the Persians by Aeschylus Pretty good, huh? Well, I'm sure you can imagine that by now Xerxes was feeling quite sorry for himself. But you can't win them all. Well, following his unsuccessful military campaigns in Greece, he retreated to Persia and supervised the finalization of numerous construction endeavors that were left incomplete by his father Darius in Susa and Persepolis. He supervised the construction of the Gate of All Nations and the Hall of Hundred Columns at Persepolis, which are the most extensive and impressive edifices within the palace. Now, on to the construction of Apadana, which he also supervised. The Takara, also known as Darius's palace after his father, and the treasury, all of which were indeed initiated by Darius, were under the completion of Xerxes. Additionally, he commissioned the construction of his own palace, which was twice the size of his father's. His architectural preferences closely resembled those of Darius, however, but his were on a much grander magnitude. The exterior face of the Apadana was adorned with the vibrant enameled brick of the time. In addition, he upheld the maintenance of the royal road constructed by Darius, completed the construction of the Susa Gate, and erected a palace in Susa. In August of 465 BC, Artabanus, the chief of the royal bodyguard and the highest ranking officer in the Persian court, orchestrated the assassination of Xerxes, aided by a eunuch named Aspamitres. Hyrcanian Artabanus gained renown not because of his famous uncle Xerxes, but because of his popularity among the religious circles at the court and his involvement in harem intrigues. He strategically placed his seven sons in influential positions and devised a scheme to overthrow the ruling Achaemenids. Now, there is a lack of consensus among Greek historians over the description of events. Cessias, in his work Persica, reports that Artabanus accused Crown Prince Darius, the eldest son of Xerxes, of murder. He then convinced Artaxerxes, another son of Xerxes, to seek revenge by executing Darius for patricide, that is, the murder of one's father. As per Aristotle's account in Politics, Artabanus executed Darius before proceeding to kill Xerxes. Upon discovering the murder, Artaxerxes executed Artabanus and all of his children. The general, Megabazus, played a role in these political schemes of his own, and his choice to change his allegiance likely prevented the Achaemenids from losing all of their power over the Persian monarchy. And with that, we reach the end of our life of Xerxes I, that great ruler of the Achaemenid Empire that couldn't quite defeat the Greeks. I'd like to thank my top-tier patrons and supporters, that is from YouTube memberships and Patreons. Uh, that is Dark, Carey, Kimberly, Ember, Ben, Britt, Charles, Aaron, James, Jeffrey, Melissa, Scott, Stark Factory, Wendy, Jaden, Sherry, Jessica, Christine, and Sally. Thank you very much for supporting the channel, and thank you for listening this far. If you're still listening right now, why not click the like and subscribe button? You're just going to get more of this kind of history. But as always with this channel, you don't really know 
what you're going to get. Perhaps one day we'll be in the 17th century Americas, and another day we'll go all the way back to the Bronze Age. Who knows? But we'll always have fun. Good night, everyone. Lots of love to you all.